Okay, so today is our last session of the Yirmiya series, and I thought it would be good just to look uh, at the overall structure of the book of Yirmiya and, uh, you know, see what we can get out of the sort of some basic themes of the book, certain ideas of the book, especially in uh, relationship to other books of the Bible, and to see, you know, again, what is what are the foci of Yirmiya, what is special about it, what is different about it. I think that would be uh, hopefully a useful thing to do as we come to the end of this uh, series. So um, the structure of the book of Yirmiya is very interesting. It is it's a long book, 52 chapters, but beginning in chapter 46, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, those chapters are prophecies directed against the nations, beginning in chapter 46. Now, prophecies directed against the nations, Yirmiya was told, remember the very beginning, he was told that he's a prophet to the nations. Navila goyim nitaticha, you're a prophet to the nations. So the bulk of the book obviously is about Israel and about the exile, but there are also prophecies in the book about nations. Now, this phenomenon that there are the prophet, the Jewish prophet prophesies about nations is not unique to Yermio at all. We have the other prophets who also prophesy against the nations. So if we think about the big three, that will be Yeshaya, Yermio, and Yechezkel. Those are the big three prophetic writings that we have in that tradition. The long books, Yeshaya is 66 chapters, and, and uh, Yechezkel is... Uh, 48 chapters, Yirmiya is 52 chapters. All three of those books contain prophecies against the nations. Now, there's two questions, actually, which are very interesting. One is where they appear in the book. And the second question is, what nations are we talking about? So first of all, where they appear in the book, in the big three. So in the book of Yeshayahu, which has 66 chapters. It's true that the book of Yeshayo is typically divided, so the scholars divide into two parts. First 39 chapters, and then beginning chapter 40 to the end, some divide into three parts, whatever, but as we have it, it's 66 chapters. And beginning in chapter 13 of Yeshayahu, we have a set of prophecies against the nations. Chapter 13, let me just see how long that goes. I'll just check that out. So it's chapter 13, it runs all the way through from 13 up to and including chapter 20, So from chapter 13 to chapter 20, a lot of chapters, there are prophecies against the nations. Now, um, Yechezkel, <coughs> also has prophecies against the nations. And Yechezkel, which is 48 chapters. So in Yechezkel, it begins, let's see where it begins in Yechezkel, it begins in chapter <coughs> 30, let's see, where is it? 20, no, it's chapter 25 in Yechezkel, up to and including chapter 32. So what's common to both of those books is that the prophecies against the nations are not the end of the book. In the case of Yeshayahu, they're in relatively towards the beginning of the book. And in the case of Yechezkel, they're relatively towards the end of the book, but there's still a good 15, 16 chapters in Yechezkel after the prophecy against the nations. Now, in contradistinction to that, we have our book, Yirmiya, and Yirmiya, it's the very end of the book. It begins in chapter 46, 46, 47, 40, 40, 50, 51, five chapters, and 52, which is the last chapter of the book we'll get to, is a chapter essentially that is taken from the book of Kings. In fact, the end of chapter 51, if you look in your Tanakh, you'll see that the end of chapter 51 is Ad Kan Divrei Yirmiya. 
This is the end of Yirmiyah's prophecies, chapter 51. And the last chapter of our book is a chapter which is more or less similar, almost identical, to the chapter at the end of the book of Kings, of Mulachim. Was put in there, I guess, they wanted to end it with, well, we'll see why, maybe, we'll speculate why it's there. But it's obviously a chapter from the book of Mulachim. So, <coughs> so, the, so the first point is that it's interesting to know where the book ends. The book, in the case of Yermia, ends with prophecy against the nations, and the books, the other two great books, have the prophecies of the nations in the middle of the book, and don't talk about the nations at the end of the book. I would also add, just as a point of interest, that the, um, there are other prophets who also prophesy about the nations. So for example, <coughs> the prophet Amos, that's how the book begins. The book begins with a set of prophecies about the nations, chapter one, and then it moves to Israel and Judah right after that. Israel and Judah are a continuation of the prophecies against the nations. That's in Amos. Some of the other minor prophets have prophecies about the nations, brief ones, in the middle of the book. And then there are three prophets who prophesy about the nations primarily, not about Israel. Those three prophets would be, of course, the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah is about Nineveh. Jonah is sent on a mission to go to Nineveh, which he initially refuses to do. That's the book of Jonah. It's one of the Treasar. The book of Ovadia. It's one of our books of Treasar. It's one chapter long. It's a prophecy against Esau and Edom. That's the book. And the prophet Nachum seems to be a prophecy essentially about Nineveh. So there are three prophet, prophetic books we have in our corpus, albeit they're short, three chapters, four chapters, one chapter, which are completely about nations and not primarily, they relate to Israel in some sense. But the book of Yonah barely mentions, if it mentions Israel at all, I don't remember it mentioning Israel altogether. The idea that the prophet is a prophet to the world, that the prophecy can encompass more than just Israel, that we act firmly within our, within our tradition. So that's, that's first of all, in terms of the structure of Yermia, it's different, because here the prophecies about the nations are the end of the book. But let me bring out another interesting point here about Yermia's prophecy about the nations, as opposed, let's say, to Yechezkel. Yechezkel prophesies about the nations as well, and the question always in our study is to look and see what nations we're talking about. So there's something very interesting about, let's say, Yirmiya. If you look at Yirmiya, let's say it starts in chapter 46. So in chapter 46, it starts with the prophecy about the nations. The first nation he talks about is Mitzrayim. Now chapter 46, the Mitzrayim, Achel Paro, that's chapter 46. Chapter 46, verse number one starts, the word of God that came to the prophet Yermia concerning the nations. And right away is Egypt. Mitzrayim is the first. And this chapter uh, is devoted to Mitzrayim. And um, it's a long chapter. Chapter 46, that's how many verses this is. This is... Uh, 28 verses, 28 verses, the first 26 of which have to do with Mitzrayim. So that's a long section. And the other long section, much longer, is, also, is the last nation that Yermia talks about, and that's Babel, Babylon, which of course is at the heart of the story of the exile. It's not so surprising. And this long, long, long prophecy is both chapter 50 and 51, and they are two very long chapters, 50 and 51. So let's see, chapter 50 has a bubble that goes on and on for a good, very long. That's, um, how many is this here? 46 verses, and then 51, another long chapter. <clears throat> it's even longer. 
just goes on and on and on. And so the prophecy against bubble goes for 58 verses. You're talking over 100 verses here about Babel. And that's the conclusion of the book. Uh, there's actually an additional piece about Babel that we'll come to in a moment. But that, I would say, is not surprising. Where we start and end is not surprising. That it's at the very end of the book is interesting. But the idea that there's a focus on Babel is hardly a surprise, given the fact that the book of Yermia is all about the destruction of the temple, the exile, uh, all related to Babel. So not surprising. Now when you open up the book of Yechezkel, and you look at the prophecies about the nations, we're not studying Yechezkel, which is very interesting, but but Yechezkel, it's very surprising because you look at the prophecies about the nations in Yechezkel, and there's something very strange about it. And that is that the, Yechezkel speaks about seven nations. He has seven different nations that he talks about, condemns, or whatever. Not many good things to be said about any of the nations. But the seven nations, five of them have very short discussion. Five nations. Two nations have a very long discussion. The longest, by far, well, not by far, the longest is Mitzrayim. That goes on for several chapters. And that's the last nation that Yechezkel discusses. Mitzrayim is never a surprise for many, many reasons. Because the story of Mitzrayim is the beginning of the birth of the Jewish people. And Mitzrayim is also intimately involved in all of the events that take place prior to the destruction. So that Mitzrayim is there is no surprise. But what is very surprising is the other nation that is singled out for an extended treatment in the book of Yechezkel. Anybody know what nation that is? It's not Bavel. Let's start with that. That is not Babel, is surprising. By the way, even more surprising is that Babel is, would appear not to be mentioned at all. Perhaps there's an allusion to Babel in two verses uh, in, 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 uh, in, in, in the book of Yechezkel, maybe. But outside of that, and the prophecy against the nations in which different nations are chosen, seven nations, Babel doesn't figure at all. It's exactly the opposite of our book. In Yermia, the hundred verses on Babel, and it's the last one. The book basically ends with Babel. But in the case of Yechezkel, Babel's not mentioned. And the one that is mentioned, very surprisingly, is the nation of Tzor, Tyre. There are three chapters on Tyre. T-Y-R-E, Tyre. And Sor is mentioned in other prophecies briefly. Sor is mentioned in conjunction with building the temple. They assist Shlomo in building the temple. That's what we know about Tyre. In the book of Yechezkel, there's a very extended and incredibly interesting treatment of Sor. My point being that, the real point is, first of all, that to understand that these, there's, certain, uh, there's a genre, there's a certain uh, way in which these stories are told prophecy about the nations being central to our major prophets, but where it appears and which nations are interesting. And Yechezkel, Yechezkel's treatment of the nations really highlights for us something about Baca and the book of Yermia, which is that in the book of Yermia, in Yechezkel, Baca is not mentioned. In the case of Yermia, it is the last nation mentioned and by far and away the longest treatment the book of Yermia is about exile. And the key nation in terms of the exile is certainly the, are the Babylonians. And therefore, it's not surprising. Now there's something else interesting. Today, I'm just trying to give an overview of the book since we've been studying it for we've met 20 times. I want to give some kind of over, some overview. Now, when you have prophecies about the nations, the question is, what is the point of the prophecy about the nations? What is the focus? So the two potential foci when the prophet, when the Jewish prophet talks about the nations. 
One is that the prophet is a Navi Lagoyim, that the role of the prophet is not just to prophesy about Israel, but the prophet has a universal responsibility to prophesy about other nations as well. Of course, the primary focus, of course, is Israel, but there's, you know, there's also the world, and the prophet feels a responsibility to speak to the world, to talk about the world, etc. It is true that the audience that the prophet is speaking to doesn't appear to be the ones he's talking about. He seems to be talking to, to Israel about the world. That is certainly the case, but, uh, but the content is about the nation, that nation, whatever it is. And what is interesting in the case of, Yer, of Yermia, that in our book, when you look at the prophecies about the nations, and this is tr much more true of Yermia than Yechezkel or Yeshayal, or the others, that in the case of Yermia, when he talks about the nations, for example, Bavel, he is constantly interrupting his talk about Bavel with talk about the Jewish people. So it would appear in the book of Yermia, on five different occasions in the prophecy of Bavel, he talks about Israel, how they were treated. He talks about the Jews in Bavel leaving Bavel, of returning to the land. So it would appear in the case of, in the book of Yermia, that even though, and maybe because of the fact that the prophecy about the nations is the end of the book, that it's really not primarily about the nations. And in the case of Yermia, more than the other books, it's about Israel's involvement with Babel. The history of Babel and the history of Israel are so intertwined. So it's true that Yermia, which is a book about exile and desolation, ends up focusing on Babel, who are the, the ones who bring about the desolation. But on the, from the other side of it, at the end of the day, his primary responsibility is to speak to the Jewish people. And in the book of Yermiyahu, there's a measure of consolation in the fact that at some point in time, Israel will leave Bata. And remember, we studied, and Yermia says, and it's very interesting, that the Jews will be in exile for 70 years. The Jews will be in Bavel for 70 years is a prophecy we encountered earlier in the book of Yermiyahu. So the fate of Bavel and the fate of Israel are, are tied together. So in this book of doom and destruction, the measure of consolation that we have is twofold. Number one, that we're gonna leave Bavel. And number two, that, the, that Bavel was responsible for all of his grief will someday meet its own very unhappy end. So that is perhaps why in Yirmiyahu, the prophecy about Bavel is so intertwined with the uh, destiny of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Israel. So that's interesting. I didn't want to just make it one other comment about the prophecy about Bavel. Just to be aware of this, I don't buy it, but I'll just tell you what what some people say. The question which the scholars all raise, and it is very interesting, is that in the book of Yechezkel, Bavel's not mentioned. I mean, not mentioned in terms of a prophecy about the nations, not directly mentioned. Perhaps, and I say perhaps, there are hints at Bavel, but there's certainly no explicit mention of Bavel, and not only that, there were two extended treatments of two other nations. So why is that the case? Why does Yechezkel not speak about Bavel? Why doesn't he mention Bavel? So I mentioned two possibilities. One is, which is quite uh, common among the scholars. I've seen this in several different places. And the argument that they advance, I don't, I don't buy it personally, but the argument that has been advanced, maybe you heard of this, is that since Yechezkel lives in Bavel, Yechezkel was a prophet in exile. Yermia, who's a contemporary, a little bit older than Yechezkel, he prophesies in the land of Israel. And Yechezkel was a prophet outside the land of Israel. Another interesting feature of Yechezkel. So that Yechezkel is living amongst the Babylonians, so the claim is he wouldn't want to say too many negative things about the Babylonians. 
given the fact that they live down the block. So to the extent he says anything at all, it's in some kind of a code or hinting at it, but he's really afraid to openly say things against Bavo. I, it doesn't appeal to me, I will tell you the truth. Um, Yermia deals with the Babylonians quite extensively. He's accused, of course, in the book of Yermia, we remember that he was accused by the Jews of being a, an, an ally of, a, almost a spy for the Babylonians. We'll come back to that in a few minutes today as well. So at the end, of the, at the end we're told in chapter, very end, chapter 51, that he speaks against Bavel. And let me turn your attention now, if you have the year of your book, uh, let's look at chapter 51, beginning at the very end of chapter 51, verse number 59. Chapter 51, verse 59. I'll read it. Hadavar Asher Haitziva Yirmiyahu Hanavi et Sraya ben Neria ben Machsia Belechto et Sikiyahu Melech Yuda Babel Bishnat Harvi et Lamacho Usraya Sar Menucha. Vayichtov Yirmiyahu et Kol Haraa Asher Tavo El Babel El Sefer Echad et Kol Advarim Ha'Ela Ktuvim El Babel. Yamata <laughs> So I'll read this translation. JPS says the instructions that the prophet Jeremiah gave to Sraya, son of Neria, son of Machsia, when the latter went with King Tzitkia of Judah to Babylon in the fourth year of Tzitkia's reign. Sraya was quartermaster. Not clear that what that means. So this prophecy takes place earlier, before the destruction, when Sitkiya is going to Babel to negotiate with the Babylonian king. So it's earlier. So Yermia, we are told, writes down. Yermia wrote down in one scroll all the disaster that would come upon Babylon, all the things that are written concerning Babylon. He writes it down. We know that writing is very big in the book of Yermia. He writes on several different occasions. And he says, he says to Sraya, when you get to Babylon, read out all of these words and say, O Lord, you, you have declared yourself concerning this place it shall be cut off without inhabitants, man or beast, that I shall be desolation for all time. And when you finish reading this scroll, tie a stone to it and hurl it into the Euphrates and say, thus shall Babylon sink and never rise again because of the disaster that I will bring upon it. That's the prophecy about Babel. So Yermio writes it down. This is in the fourth year of Tzitkiah's reign, well before the destruction of the temple, seven years before, eight years before the destruction of the temple. He's negotiating. And already Yermio writes down a prophecy of Babel and that just writes it down, hands it to Sraya, tells him to read it, and then to make a pronouncement about it and to throw it into the Euphrates River and say, thus shall Babylon sink. It's very interesting. In other words, the prophet, sometimes we have a prophecy which is spoken, and sometimes we have prophecies that are acted out. This is an example of a prophecy that is being acted out. So let's take another, I'll give you another example of a prophecy that was acted out. If you remember in the book of Mulachim, so the prophet Elisha is, is sick, he's about to die, and he calls the king of, 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 of Israel over, and he says, take a bow and an arrow, 
and shoot the, shoot, shoot the arrows and say an arrow against the Arameans. Against the Arameans. So the king of Israel, I think it's Yoash, shoots the arrows three times. So Elisha gets very angry at him. He says to him, why did you shoot the arrow only three times? If you had shot the arrow more times, you would have destroyed the Arameans. But this way you'll defeat the Arameans, but you won't destroy them. That's, I believe, in chapter 13 of, of, of Second Kings, of Mulachim. It's actually an interesting story. But there you have an example of acting out the prophecy. You may have other examples of acting out prophecies. One could say that the book of Breshi, that Abraham traveling around the land, he's symbolically possessing the land. He's acting out the prophecy. So we have prophets that act out prophecy. And presumably, acting out the prophecy is a stronger form of prophecy than simply saying the words. You're actually acting it out. Nachmanides, the Ramban, in his commentary on the Torah, talks about this. He has a mystical understanding that when you act it out, it's more certain that it will take place. But leaving the mysticism out of it, this is an example of not just writing it down in a book, but making a pronouncement about Babylon and then throwing it into the Euphrates River. So shall Babylon sink. And that's the very end of, of I, I, these are the words of Jeremiah. So Jeremiah, in this case, now you might say that he's reading the book, he's not reading it to anybody, they won't hear about it. But it doesn't appear to me that he's trying to, in any, that Jeremiah I'm talking about, is concerned about the prophecy. Now, why do I mention this? Because in the prophecy in the last two chapters, chapter 50, 51, he talks about Babel for a hundred verses. But in two different places, he has another name for Babel. One is the word Sheshach. Sheshach. That's one place, Sheshach. And the second place, he calls Babel Lev Kamai. It's chapter 51, verse number one, is Lev Kamai. Sheshach is there too. I, I don't have the verse in front of me now. But in two places, he calls Sheshach and Lev Kamai. Now, what is Sheshach and Lev Kamai? Anybody know what Sheshach and Lev Kamai is? If you want to speak, just unmute yourself and talk. Sheshach and Lev Kamai is what's called Atbash. Are you familiar with, 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 with Atbash? No, I'll tell you. Okay. What Atbash is, Aleph Tov Bet Shin. Atbash is found in rabbinic writings. But it's actually found in Yomiyahu. Atbash means the switching of letters. The, the Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters. The first letter is Aleph, and the last letter is Tuf. Atbash is when you switch the letters, when instead of the Aleph, you write a Tuf. Instead of the Bet, you write a Shin. Instead of the Gimel, you write a Resh. So if you take the word Sheshach and and you use Atbash, Sheshach is Babel. Babel, Bet Bet Lamed is Shin Shin Kaf, backwards, reading the alphabet from the other side. What is Lev Kamai? Lev Kamai. You, you don't have to work it out. If you work at Lev Kamai, you will see the five letters is Kaf, Sin, Dawid, Yud, Mem. Kastim. Who are the Kastim? Babylonians. Babel with Kastim are Babylonians. So in two occasions in Jeremiah's prophecy, in 50 and 51, he refers to Babel as Sheshach, and he talks about Kastim. Now what is that about? So some people feel that what it's about is he doesn't want to, he's afraid or doesn't want to offend the Babylonians, so he talks in code. He's not saying bad things will happen to Babel. He's saying Sheshach's in trouble, Olev Kamai is in trouble. Now, I must say, in all honesty, I find that difficult to accept. Because he mentions Babel many, many other times. And he mentions it for a hundred, a hundred, a hundred verse rant against Babel. So it doesn't strike me that Sheshach and Olev Kamai is there to disguise 
whom he's speaking about. It's pretty hard to miss whom he's speaking about. And again, this whole business of writing it down, handing it to somebody, read it. Now maybe it's done privately, it's possible. But I don't actually believe, I find it hard to accept. But this, this it's been put out there that he's trying to disguise what he's saying. Now in Yechesko, that's different. In Yechesko, he doesn't mention Bavel at all, actually. In the prophecy of the nations, there's no Bavel. It's unbelievable, but there's no Bavel. So some feel there's no Bavel because Yechesko was afraid to prophesy against, he lives there, so he was afraid. I mean, the prophets, generally speaking, are not afraid. It's where they get in trouble. The prophet has one job to speak the truth, which often puts him in trouble. In the case of Yirmiya, as we've seen, they try to kill him on more than one occasion. So if it's not that, if it's not fear, I, I would suggest something else about Yechesko. I mean, it's not our book, but Yechesko and Yirmiya are actually contemporary prophets. I think it's something else in Yechesko, which has nothing to do with, the, with this. I think in Yechesko, from Yechesko's standpoint, it's a very different kind of book. From Yechesko's standpoint, he makes it clear. I mean, Yirmiya might even agree with this. The Babylonians are God's instrument to, dis- to, to punish and to attack and destroy nations. They are God's implement. And for Yechesko, maybe unlike the other prophets, for Yechesko, when you, when you are God's implement, you don't get critiqued. I think that's Yechesko's point of view. Yechesko is a very different kind of book. I would say Yechesko was within our writings, I would call it perhaps even a, 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 a mystical book. It's a very different conception of the world, not just the world of all creation, God's place in creation. So as far as Yechesko is concerned, I would say not mentioning Babel, not that he's in love with Babel, but that Yechesko, the focus is on those who, who don't carry out God's will. It's a God-centered book, Yechesko. It's all about God and God's place. I call that mystical. So I think in Yechesko, Babel's not mentioned for that reason. That's my, my, my opinion. I can't prove it. That's my sense. Um, but in any event, it's very important to take note in our study always what is there, what's not there, who he speaks about. It's interesting, in Yechesko, for example, three chapters about Tyre, about Tsar, which is very surprising, given that Tsar doesn't seem to be a major player in terms of Israel. We don't find in the Bible, outside of helping Solomon build a temple, we don't find Tsar to be a, a major player. But in Yechesko, three chapters, we're not studying Yechesko, and there are three unbelievably interesting chapters on top of it. So each book has to be seen in its own light. Okay, so that's the first point I wanted to make in terms of... Rabbi? Yes, please. Um, maybe switching the letters from the beginning to the end has to do with making it more of a universal, you know, like from A to Z. Is that a possibility of why he's changing these names? It may not be just Bavel. It will be more than Bavel at some point. Could be. Poss- certainly yeah. possible. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to point that out since we're studying Yirmiyah, and that is a, you know, it is, it's interesting to note, by the way, that uh, it could be from A to Z is certainly, you know, from the, from the first to the last. Um, yeah, it could be so. It's also the last, it's the last nation mentioned in the book at, at, at a great length. Yeah. Um, could be. I mean, it's interesting that this, this idea of switching the letters, which we typically think of, I mean, most people think of it as being some kind of rabbinic thing, you actually find in the Bible. Yeah. It. It's clear. That, and who knows what else they had as well, other combinations of letters and stuff like that. This one is extremely interesting. Um, so that's the first point I wanted to make about the, the structure of the book of Yirmiya. And it's very unusual. We don't have this in any other book. It's the only book in the Bible where the prophecies about the nations are at the end. And part of it, as I said, could be that it's not a book with great consolation in it. The book is a book of exile. The book is very depressing. Depressing for Israel, and a depressing book in terms of Yirmiya's own life, basically. He has a difficult life. He speaks the truth. 
He ends up in the land of Egypt himself, because at the end, we'll get to that in a few minutes. He ends up in the land of Egypt. So I was thinking on this, the last of these sessions, there'll be other, other stuff, but um, in terms of Yirmiya, I was thinking about endings in general, how things end, how books end. Because, you know, in books, maybe in life, how you begin and how you end is very central. So I was thinking about the ending of the book of Yirmiya, and it's, it, it's, not a, it's not a book with a happy ending, that's for certain. The book of Yechesko, for example, the last nine chapters of Yechesko, very difficult chapters, are about this new temple that's going to be built. Nine chapters of this, I might say, mystical temple that will be the center of all creation. That's how the book of Yechesko ends. It begins with the chariot vision. Yechesko sees this amazing chariot, God's chariot. So it begins with God's presence in existence in the universe, and it ends with God's, with a prophetic lengthy description, nine chapters long, about this temple that will be at the center of everything. That's a prophecy of the book of Isaiah, called second Isaiah, if you wish. But the book of Yeshayahu, beginning in chapter 40 through 66, is fundamentally consolation. Glorious chapters of consolation, of return and restoration, etc. Yes, it describes a different kind of world. But we have some of that in Yermia 2, chapter 31. But fundamentally, Yermia is, is, is very different. There isn't that much consolation. There are two or three chapters of consolation that we would call consolation in our book. But it ends with Bava. Perhaps there's some consolation and there are hints of return there. But the focus is Bava. Then you have the last chapter that's appended, which is chapter 52, that we'll get to in a little while. But I was thinking about the books of the Torah. We have five books, five books of Moses. How do they end? So I thought it would be a good framework to discuss um, to discuss uh, the, the, the book of Yermia, sort of give an overview of the book of Yermia. So going backwards, let's say starting with the end of the Torah. We have five books. The book of Devarim is the last book, last book of the Torah. How does the book of Deuteronomy end? So the book of Deuteronomy, which is filled with Moshe's critique of Israel. And it's interesting to remember in our study that Yermia and Moshe are similar in many ways. They both have that same calling, the beginning of Yermia, when he's told he's been chosen before his birth. And the story reminds us of the calling of the choosing of Moshe for a very difficult task to take people out of Egypt, to instruct us in the desert. At the end of the day, Israel will enter the land, Moshe remains in exile. Very similar stories. But how does the book of, how does the Torah end? So the Torah ends, even though the book of Devarim has many, many critiques. Moshe reviews the desert experience, pretty negative. But the end of the end of the Torah, we end with blessings. Zot bracha. These are the blessings. And the very end of the Chumash, we read this Simchas Torah every year. The end of the Chumash, we're talking about Moshe dies. Moshe can see the future. Moshe sees the top, the top of the mountain. And the very end is Yoshua bin Nun Malebua Chachma. And Joshua, Moses' disciple, was filled with the wisdom of God. Moses had placed his hands upon him, and all of Israel listened and did all that God commanded Moshe. So the Torah ends on a, on a good note, a positive note. Of course he dies, he's mortal, but he's able to see the f- future, which is amazing. But then he has a pupil, and the teachings of Moshe are transmitted to Joshua, his, his devoted disciple. And all Israel listened and did not what God commanded Joshua, but what God commanded Moshe. That's how the Torah ends. It ends with the trans- transmission of the transition of the leadership from Moshe to Yeshua. Moshe has trained him, has placed his hands upon him. He has a successor. And that's, a, I would say, the happy ending of the Torah. We read this every year. We end on a very happy note. Of course, it's sad Moshe has to die. 
That's life. But he lives 120 years. He has a full life. He does everything your human being can do. He's God's agent, and he passes on the tradition. That's how the Torah ends. Now, when you get to the book of Yirmiyahu, before we get to the prophecies about the nations, we have a little chapter, which is chapter 45. Take a look at chapter 45. We're going to read the whole chapter 45 right now. It's a five verses long, chapter 45. Some of them are 60 verses. This one's five verses. Hadavar asher diber Yirmiyahu hanavi el baruch ben Neriyah. Because vowet advarim aegla al sefer mi pir yemiyahu. Bashanahar viit li o yakim ben yoshiyahu melch yudalimar. So this is the word that the prophet Jeremiah spoke to Baruch ben Neriah. Baruch is his disciple. Who was, he was writing these words in a scroll at Yirmiyah's dictation in the fourth year of Yehoiakim, son of Yoshiyahu of Judah. So this is the prophecy that takes place earlier. Tzikiyo was the last king. This is prior to Tzikiyo. And this is the, what he's writing down. Baruch it writes down, remember the story where Yermia is in jail, and he dictates to Baruch who writes everything down. Then Baruch brings the scroll to different people, and the king of Israel, Yehoiakim, bad guy, he burns it, tears it, tears it and burns it. This is also writing, Sefer. We, all the time we see the Sefer here. So, this is the prophecy. The prophecy is about you, Baruch. The prophecy about his disciple. Baruch is writing this down, by the way, as he's talking to him. You say, Woe is me. Lord has added grief to my pain. I am worn out with groaning. I have found no rest. Koto mare love. So Amarta, the first verse seems like it's directed to Yermio. Koto mare, or maybe Baruch is saying this. Koto mare love. Say this to so God. God says to Yermio, say this to Baruch. Ko amar Hashem. Hine Hashem boniti ani horeis. Et Hashem natati ani notesh. Behold, says God, what I am built, I am uprooting. I, what, I, what I built, I am overthrowing. What I, 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 what I planted, I, I am uprooting. And this applies to the whole land. And you expect great things for yourself? Don't expect them. Kiri may be ra'ah akol basar numashem. You, if you expect great things, Baruch, for yourself, don't expect them. I bring disaster upon all flesh, but I will grant you your life in all the places you shall go. That's chapter 45, and in a sense, one might say it's the end of the book, because the very next chapter begins the prophecy about the nations. So chapter 45, very unusual, is a prophecy to his disciple, his faithful disciple. Yermia has a disciple. Most people in the Bible don't have disciples, a disciple. The two that have them are Moshe, he has Yoshua, and Elio Hanavi has Elisha. Those are two parallel stories, and those are disciples. At the end of the day, it works out well with all the questions, with all the hesitations that they have about their pupils. Each one has doubts about their own pupil. Moshe has doubts about Yeshua. Eliel has many doubts about Elisha. At the end of the day, it, it's a transmission from the teacher to the pupil. Elisha replaces Eliyahu, Yeshua replaces Moshe successfully. In the case of Baruch, that's the third example of a disciple. In the case of Baruch, the prophecy is don't expect too much because the times are such that you can't actually uh, succeed your teacher. The world is in such a place which prohibits or prevents greatness. 
You live in a time where you can't be great. Don't expect it. You can expect to survive. I'll keep you alive. I'll protect you that you'll survive. But more than that, you can't expect. That's the prophecy about Baruch. It's a sad prophecy because he is an incredibly devoted disciple. We know the story where he's, Yermio dictates and he writes. That's the story. And we also know that the perception of Baruch in terms of some people is that he's a very powerful person. Because in the chapter, just prior to this, where Yermio is asked by the, by the survivors after the story of Gedalia, he's, uh, they ask Yermia, what does God want us to do? Whatever God wants us to do, we're going to do. We want to go to Egypt. So Yermia comes back and says, don't go to Egypt. Don't go down there. Stay in the land. It's going to be safe. Don't go. Of course, they refuse to listen. They go down to Mitzrayim. Those are the previous chapters. And when Yermia says, don't go, their response is, we don't believe that God ever spoke to you. We don't believe God told us not to go to Mitzrayim. This is the work of Baruch. Baruch is convincing you to say this because he wants to hand us over to the Babylonians, which is a very interesting statement. And uh, because you see that the extent to which the other people see Baruch as a major player to the degree that he's pressuring you, number one, to prophesy this way. They presume he has the power to actually convince Yermio what to say, which is hard to believe. And they also believe that he's a powerful person, that he can work with the Babylonians to hand us over. So they presume that Baruch has this incredible power, both over Yermia, influence over Yermia, and B, that he is deeply interconnected with the Babylonians. So they assume Baruch is a major player. But we're told over here that's not the case. Don't expect. You expect greatness, don't expect it. It's not happening. The times will not permit it. It's a time of destruction. It's a difficult time for the world. All your expectations, it's not going to happen. So this is very striking to me in terms of a contrast between the end of the Torah, the story of Moshe. The book of Yermia begins with a, a, a similar story to Moshe, similar to the burning bush. Um, story over here says the ending is very different. The ending of Moshe's ending, Zotar Bracha, is very positive. It's as positive as it could possibly be. A full life, you can at least see the dream. You can't experience it, you see it. And you hand it over to somebody else who carries on the mission, and your teachings live. Your teachings live through your, through your student. Israel listened and did what Moshe told, was told by God. So that's a contrast between the ending of the Chumash on one hand and the ending of Yirmiyah on the other. That's the story of Baruch. That's the story of succession, discipleship. That's the Rebbe who doesn't succeed. It's not his fault. The times don't allow for, for, for as it says, they don't allow for greatness. You have, a, a, by the way, a story in the Talmud, very similar story in the Talmud, about Shmuel HaKatot. Samuel the small. Shmuel HaKatan, the Talmud says, was the one very beloved person who added the 19th blessing to the Shmona Esrei, Vulamashinim. He's the one who, they had composed 18 blessings, Shmona Esrei, and they wanted to have a blessing against certain wicked people, whoever the wicked ones are, the Mashinim, the slanderers, the wicked ones, etc. And Shmuel HaKatan got up and he composed this blessing. And the Talmud says about Shmuel HaKatan, he was once in a room and they said about him, there's somebody in this room who could be another Moses, but the generation is not worthy. Shmuel HaKatan. In other words, people are limited by the situation in which they find themselves. Um, you know, it's society's obligation to create opportunities, but Sometimes there are things beyond society's possibilities, and sometimes there are just things that happen. Sometimes society doesn't understand what they can do, but in any event, people who could achieve greatness don't achieve it. And this is the story of Baruch. So that's one ending of the Torah that we have, and the contrast to Yermiah is very striking. Then, 
we have the five books of Moses. There's another ending. Um, and I would say that the two books that have similar endings are the book of Genesis, Preshit, and the book of Bamidbar. The book of Bamidbar, the fourth book of the Torah, one might say is in a certain sense the ending of the Torah. Because the book of Devarim is a recapitulation. It's Moses, Moses uh, looking at the experience of the desert. Devarim has a completely different feel to it. It's the fifth book of the Torah, but it feels different. It's completely different. But in terms of the story of Israel, that is the story of the patriarchs and the matriarchs and the story of the Exodus, that's over the first four books. And two of those books have a very similar ending. The first book of the Torah, Breshit, ends with the story of Joseph. And the story of Joseph is in that, the end of the Chumash, it's about how Joseph reconciles with his brothers, or doesn't reconcile with his brothers. So the end of the Torah, the end of Sefer Breshit, we all remember when the brothers come before Joseph, they're back in the land of Egypt, and they say to Joseph in chapter 50, take us as your slaves. They were afraid Joseph will kill them. It's after Yaakov has died. And Yosef cries, says, what am I, God? He says, you may have thought evil, but God had a different plan. And someday, says Joseph, we'll be reunited. After I die, take my bones back with you to the land of, to the land of Canaan. We'll be reunited after my death in the land of Canaan. And that's how the book of Breshit ends. And Joseph died, and they placed him in a, in a coffin. That's the first book of the Torah. The fourth book of the Torah, the book of Bamidbar, how does that book end? If you recall how the book of Bamidbar ends. The book of Bamidbar ends, chapter 36, that there's a story in Bamidbar about the daughters of Tzulafchad. Daughters of Tzulafchad, Tzulafchad was a man who died and had five daughters. He had no sons. So the question is, now you're coming to the land, you're going to parcel out the land according to the families, do Tzulafchad's daughter get his portion or not? The presumption, their presumption was that the women, the girl can't inherit from the father. So if that be the case, then Tzulafchad will lose his portion. His brothers will take, will divide their family plot, and Tzulafchad won't get a piece of it because he's not around, and he has only daughters. They appeal to Moshe in chapter 27. Moshe is, argues their case. And Tzulafchad's daughters are given, are permitted to inherit their father. That's the blood Tzulafchad. That's in chapter 27. But the last chapter of the book, which is chapter 36, they're the heads of the tribes of Menashe. Tzulafchad was from the tribe of Menashe. And they come to Moshe and they complain. They say that if Tzulafchad's daughters get married, they presume the husband will possess the property. And these five, five women, if they marry outside the tribe, the tribe is going to lose land. They say, we're going to lose land. Why should we lose? And why should the others gain for no saf, for no saf? In fact, it, it stores, says that the heads of the tribe of Menashe, the son of Yosef, came and complained. So the last chapter of the book of Bamidbar, when we studied Bamidbar, we talked about this in some ways, the last chapter of Bamidbar, suddenly the story of Joseph and his brothers comes to the fore. What upsets the tribe of Menashe, whose Joseph's son is, that Yosef, that the other tribe will get more than us. There's this sense over there of the rivalry, rivalry between the tribes, and that Joseph and the other tribes, Joseph and his brothers have a fight. What's going to be? We don't want to lose land. It's very nice. You know, but if they marry out, Marry out means a different tribe. Our tribe will lose. That's the last chapter of Bamidbar. The society is structured by tribes. It's one nation, but it's 12 tribes. Like we have now in the United States of America. We have one government, one federal government, and we have 50 states. So who's responsible for taking care of things? That's the question, right? I mean, it shouldn't be a question, obviously. Everybody's responsible, but given present leadership, it's a question. So who is responsible for dealing with crises? <clears throat> so that's the book of Bamidbar.
So what Moshe does in that story, remember how Moshe solves the problem. He solves the problem in that case by saying, yes, they can get married, but let's instruct them to marry from their own tribes so they don't lose, the tribe doesn't lose. And that's what happens. They all happily marry, presumably, to men from their own tribes. So the tribe of Yosef, of Menashe, is happy. The daughters of Salafchid are happy. The other tribes are happy. And that's how the book of, of Bamid Bar ends, the fourth book of the Torah. The fourth book of the Torah, we might say the last book of the narrative, actually recalls for us Joseph and his brothers. Joseph and his brothers, such a central story for us because it's about the enemy within. It's not about the external enemies that we have, who are often there, no question. But we have our own internal issues, which are equally important. How do we get along with each other? Different factions within Israel. How do we work together? Which is always a challenge, working together. So book one of the Torah, book four of the Torah, that's the story of Joseph. That's a very central story to the Jewish people throughout its history. Now, where does the story of Joseph appear in the book of Yirmiyahu? We have the story of Joseph in the book of Yirmiyahu. Where do we have the story of Joseph in the book of Yirmiyahu? So another ending to the book. The story is the story of Gedalia. Gedalia ben Achikam, right? Gedalia was the governor appointed by the Babylonians after the destruction of the temple. We had looked at that earlier last time we met. I'll just go over it briefly. So Gedalia was appointed by the Babylonians. And what happens after Gedalia is appointed by the Babylonians uh, is that um, Jews from other countries begin to uh, go, begin to leave their lands and travel to Israel. So there's a sense that the Jewish community can be restored, even after the destruction of the temple, and two prior exiles, and Israel is exiled, and Judah is exiled during Yechania, and the temple's destroyed, but there still are people in the land, and Gedalia is the governor, and Yirmiyah supports him, and Jews start coming into the land. And then a group of soldiers come to Gedalia and say to him, you better be careful, because the king of Ammon has conspired with people to have you killed. This is found in chapter, chapter 40. Chapter 40 of Yirmiya, beginning in verse number 13. Yochanan ben Koreach v'chosorea chayorim asher basodeh, verse number 13, chapter 40. Yochanan, the officers of the troops, come to the Dalia at Mitzvah and say to him, do you know, Yodoa Teda, you should know, Ki Ba'aris Melech B'nei Amon Shalach et Yishmael ben Netanyo Hakot Chanefesh. The king of Amon, Ba'aris, has sent Yishmael, that's his name, to kill you. Gedalia doesn't believe them. Yochanan says to him, it's true. And not only that, if you wish, I can assassinate Yishmael. Leave it up to me. Nobody will know anything. I'll kill him. Aket Yishmael ben Netanya, in verse number 15. Ish no one's going to know. Lomo yakeka nefesh, v'nafotsu kol Yehuda, hanik botzim elecha, v'yavda she'erit Yehuda. Why should he kill you? And then all the, the remnant of Israel will be dispersed. Let me take care of this matter. And Gedalia says, do not do this. Don't kill Yishmael. Yishmael. You speak falsely about Yishmael. So he's, uh, he refuses to accept this Lashon Hara, you know? I don't accept the Lashon Hara. He says, I don't believe it. He would never do such a thing. The accusation is that the king of Ammon for his own purposes. Now, Ammon and Babel don't get along. There are many ways to explain this, but in fact, he doesn't believe it. What happens, of course, chapter 41, 
Bachodesh Ashvi in the seventh month of Tishrei, Bo Yishmo ben Netanya ben Elishama Mizera Hamucha. Yishmo comes, he's of royal blood, so he may have other reasons for, to want to get rid of Dalia. Vasara Anashim Ito, he comes with ten men, and he comes to Gedalia. And they eat bread together. Eating bread is a sign of camaraderie. He comes with ten men, they're eating bread together. They killed Gedalia. They killed Gedalia as Yochanan had warned him. And uh, they killed the ones. Uh, who were with Gedalia. <coughs> and later in the story, he encounters a bunch of people who are carrying offerings uh, to bring to God's house. And he says to them, let me show you where Gedalia is. And he kills them as well. And he throws them into a pit. That's in verse number seven. Now, when you think about the story about the, the killing of, Yish, of Gedalia, Killing of Gedalia basically ends the possibility of restoring the Jewish nation. And the people that are remaining after the death of Gedalia, where do they go? Beginning in chapter 42, that's the story I mentioned earlier, they end up going back to Egypt. They ask Yermiel, we want to go to Egypt. See what God has to say about it. So Yermiel says in chapter 42, 43, I'll tell you what God has to say about it. If you're going to listen to what God has to say, oh, we'll certainly listen. So he says, God says, don't go. No, we're going to go anyway. We don't believe you. God never said it. Baruch is pressuring you. We don't believe you. So they end up in Egypt. They take Yermia with them. And that's the end of the year of Yermia. The last thing we hear about Yermia, outside of his prophecies about the nations, which may have been much earlier, the last story in the narrative is Yermia in the land, prophesying in the land of Egypt if you made a mistake, and God will bring about the destruction of Mitzrayim and the destruction, for the most part, of the Jewish people living in Mitzrayim. A few will survive, but those that went back to Egypt will not survive. Now, if you think about the story of Gedalia, and of course, on our calendar, we have a fast day called Tzom Gedalia, which is between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, it's the day after Rosh Hashanah. And what that represents is the end of the possibility of staying in the land. But if you think of the elements of the Gedalia story, it's hard to read the Gedalia story without thinking of the, uh, of the uh, Joseph story. As many of the elements of the Joseph story. First of all, we have the one, the, the one who, kills, who kills Gedalia. His name is Yishmael. Strange name for a Jew. But that's his name. His name is Yishmael. Now we know, how does Joseph get to Egypt? What does the Torah say, actually? How does Joseph get down to Egypt? So it's a good question what happened exactly. But it would appear from the Chumash. The Ishmaelim. Ishmaelim. Well, actually, there were two different groups. There's the Ishmaelim on one hand, and the Midianites on the other. The Midianites. But it sounds like, it sounds from the, if you just read the Chumash without the Rashi and everything, it sounds like Joseph was thrown into a pit. Here we also have a pit in the story. Um, and the idea was that Judah said to his brothers, why should we kill him? Because in the pit he's going to die, that there's no water. So they see Midianites from a distance. I'm sorry, they see Yishmaelim from a distance. And they say, Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let's not kill him. Sorry. But what happened is in the interim, it would appear, Midianites came and they pulled Joseph out of the pit and they sold Joseph to the Ishmaelim and the Ishmaelites brought him down to Egypt. So Yishmael is the one who actually brings Joseph to Egypt with the assistance of the Midianites. Now in the story over here, we have Yishmael. Here's not the Midianites who assist Yishmael. Here it's the Ammonites, right? But you have over here these two different groups. You have the Ammon, the king of Ammon, and we have Yishmael. And we have the pit 
and we also have the ten, the the ten men, right? In the case of the sale of Joseph, it would appear there were ten brothers. Presumably Benjamin wasn't there, but we know that the ten brothers, ten brothers go down to Egypt, right? So we have the ten brothers, and not only that, but when Joseph's in the pit, by Lechem, they sat down to eat bread together. So you have all the elements over here. You have the Ishmael, which is the main element. You have the assisting nation. You have the pit. You have the Lechem. You have the ten. And you have, most importantly, going down to Egypt. Because what happens in the story, after the death of Gedalia, the cause, death of Gedalia causes Israel, they didn't have to go to Egypt, but they choose to go to Egypt out of fear, and they end up in Mitzrayim. So we're talking about the endings of the book of Yirmiyahu, one, the different endings in the book. There's the prophecy about the nations, there's a prophecy about Baruch, and there's the story of Gedalia. And the story of Gedalia actually recalls two of the endings of the Torah, which is the book of Breshit and the book of Bamidbar, which is all about Joseph and his brothers. The difference is that in the case of Joseph and his brothers, at the end of Bamidbar and the end of Breshit, okay, the brothers and Joseph don't get along and they never will get along, but they managed to work out their differences. In each of those stories, they work it out in one way or another. Joseph says, listen, okay, you did a bad thing. This was God's will. Someday we, we, we will be reunited. Take me with you after my death. The idea, of, the idea of reconciling Joseph to his brothers, which begins even earlier, when Yaakov actually says to Joseph, your two sons are like my sons, and Joseph becomes not one tribe, but two tribes, which is Ephraim and Menashe, so Joseph gets an extra tribe. He gets the birthright, one might say. On the other hand, there's no tribe of Joseph. You maybe don't like your brother so much, but you may like your nephews, which is what you have in the Chumash. He's able to include Joseph through Joseph's children. So there are ways to include people. We find ways to include people. Another thing is, okay, right now we don't get along. After my death, we get along much better. So after I die, take my bones back and bury me. In the case of Tzalafgad, the, the, the tribe of Joseph says, what should the other tribes gain? We, we got two problems. What should we lose? And what should the other tribes gain, the Nosaf? So there's a sense of animosity. Why should they get more? Why, should more? Why are they better than me? Why should Tzalafgad very nice? They're going to marry a different tribe. The tribe will, our tribe will lose. So Moshe figures out a way to work it out. In that instance, it's marrying inside your own tribe. So, so yeah, so there, the problems get worked out. There's always problems. The issue is how do you work out the problems to people's not ultimate satisfaction, but to work it out in such a way that we can continue to be together. You've got to figure out a way. It always requires compromises on all sides, no doubt. But in the Chumash, it's a happy ending, I would say given the reality of life, it's a happy ending. Moshe finds a way to satisfy both parties by finding some kind of happy compromise. Joseph finds a way to stay connected to the brothers who suspect that he plans to kill them. Take us as slaves, they think he's gonna kill them. And the fact is, that wasn't his plan, but they're suspicious of him. So Joseph consoles them, I'm not God, this is God's will, we're all in this together, we're all slaves, someday we'll be reunited. Those are the happy endings of the Chumash. The Book of Yirmiya doesn't have those kind of endings. The Book of Yirmiya ends with Mitzrayim. Now there is a happy ending in the book as well. We'll get to it. Happy of sorts. It's not a happy ending. It's not a happy book. But I wanted to point out that the endings of the Chumash essentially are present in the Book of Yirmiya, but in different form. So you have the ending of, in the Chumash, Joshua takes, continues Moshe, in Yermia, Baruch cannot continue to be another Yermia. The times don't allow for it. He will survive. God will protect him, positive. But don't expect the Dolot. Don't expect great things at this time. It's not possible. Story of Joseph in the Chumash, of course, this conflict gets worked out. But in the case of Yermia, it doesn't get worked out. And for all kinds of reasons, by the way. 
Not that Gedalia is a good person. He doesn't want to take the Lush and Hara. He doesn't accept the Lush. I, I don't believe you. Told, he wouldn't do such a thing. So he's, in, in a way, Gedalia is an innocent. He wants to see people in the best possible light. It's very lovely quality. Problem is, he, got, he's, he, he's, he has, doesn't have his man figured out. Yishmael is out to get him for, for many reasons. He's connected to Amon. He's from the royal descent himself. He's jealous, perhaps. Doesn't trust the Babylonians. All kinds of possible reasons. So it's not a story which has a happy Joseph ending. It's a Joseph story of conflict, but ends up in Mitzrayim. Okay, before we continue with the last piece of this, uh, does anybody want to speak up, comment, or make any kind of suggestion? I'll just, if you do, just unmute yourself and please speak up. We're missing Suri today. She always speaks up. But where's Suri? <laughs> Not with us yet. But please speak up and we'll, if you have something to say, and we'll, then we'll just finish up the, the last piece over here. We'll just finish up now the, um, another ending to the Book of Yermia. The Book of Yermia has several endings. He talks about the prophecy about the nations. We talked about the story of Baruch. We talked about the story of Gedalia. And each of these, these are the stories that, stories or the pieces of the book through which the book is completed. And each of these has a particular um, focus and each of these can be, I think, well understood in light of other endings that we have in our tradition, essentially the, what the Torah says, the endings of the Torah. Um, but the book of Yermia, the way it's composed, the prophecy about the nations, story of Bavel, ends in chapter 51, 50 and 51, those two chapters, but they're very long chapters. You know, the chapter division is not a Jewish division. It doesn't always reflect uh, the way the chapters were divided. For whatever reason, they made two chapters out of it. Could well be four chapters, 100, over 100 verses. In any event, that's not the last chapter of the book. The last chapter of the book is chapter 52. And chapter 52 is virtually identical to the end of the book of Mulachim. The end of the book of Mulachim, book of Kings, which is the book of exile. Book of Kings and the book of exile and the book of Yermia are very similar in the sense they're both about the exile. The book of Kings is written by somebody, whoever it may be, who's probably sees the exile and asks the question, how do we get into this mess in the first place? That's the book of Kings. And it's a mess. It's one mistake after the next. It's the exile of Israel, the northern kingdom. It's a split in the nation. Exile of the north. Then the exile of, of Judah. Destruction of the temple, etc. That's the book of Kings. And the book of Yermia is very similar to that. So it's not surprising that the last chapter of Yermia is essentially the end of the book of Mulachim. Whoever, whoever puts the book of Yermia together here, I think we can say with some certainty that the chapter 52 was essentially a chapter that was primarily a piece of Book of Kings. And then we take that and we end with the Book of Yermio with the same chapter. Perhaps we don't want to end with Bava. We don't want to end our, our book with the Babylonians. We want to end up back focusing on, 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 on Israel. So chapter 52, take a look at chapter 52, it reveals what some of what we already have in this book, in the book of Yermia, namely the destruction of the temple, the capture of King Tzidkiyahu, who has broken his promise. Tzidkiyahu was the last king of Judah who swore allegiance to, uh, to the king of Babel, to Nebuchadnezzar, and he breaks his, he breaks his, his, his commitments. It's a story that appears in uh, Kings, it's mentioned here in Yirmiyahu. It's hinted at in Yechezkel. It's an important story, and he tries to escape from the Babylonians. Yirmiyahu tells him several times, don't do it. He warned him many times, make your peace with Babel, you'll be okay. But Sikiyo is afraid and maybe too weak to do that. So he fights, he resists Babel. He tries to escape. A terrible story, He's, his family is massacred before his eyes. He's blinded, and he's shipped up in chains to Babel. 
until he dies. That's what we hear in That's the beginning of chapter 52, uh, up to and including verse number 11. And then the destruction of the temple, beginning in verse number 12 of chapter 52. Um, Nebuchadnezzar sends his henchmen, his generals, chief of the guards, Nebuchadnezzar. And verse number seven, in verse number 13, the temple is burnt by Yisrof at Beit Hashem, at Beit HaMelech. They destroy the temple, the king's house, the walls of Jerusalem. And uh, he, um, he leaves some people in the land. The, the weakest of the weak he leaves in the land. He leaves them what would appear to be vine dressers and field hands, which the, some of the commentaries and the Talmud takes to mean to be able to work the land for the benefit of, of the Babylonians. But everybody else is exiled. And beginning in verse 17, it describes the vessels of the temple that were taken to Babel. Long description of this beginning in verse number 17. Amodei HaNechoshet, all the pieces of the temple that remain, some had been taken earlier. This goes on and on and on to verse 23. The temple is pillaged, destroyed, looted, pieces are taken. Uh, then more people were massacred by the, by the Babylonians. Um, and that goes up to and including verse number 27. So Judah was exiled from its land. The political hierarchy the killed, massacred, temple burnt, temple looted, other people killed. That's um, then, then in verse 28 and 29 and verse 30 describes the number of people that were exiled. That were, so the Jewish people were in captivity. There's a small group that remains under the direction of Gedalia. It's not mentioned here. And now we have the end of Yirmiyahu, uh, book of Yirmiyahu, beginning in verse number 31. So let's just end the book here and we'll uh, have completed our study of Yirmiyahu this year. In the, so it says in the 37th year of the exile of Yehoiachin, Yehoiachin was a king who reigned very briefly and was taken captive by the Babylonians. And he's there, he's alive, he's not killed. And he's, he is, the, the dating here is to the time of the exile of Yehoiachin. By the way, in Yechezkel, the, the, the Yehoiachin is often mentioned in terms of dating. It's interesting. So he's in jail this whole time. In the 37th year, on the 25th day of the 12th month, the king of Babylon, Evil Mirodech, took note of Yehoiachim and he releases him from jail. He's released from jail in this year. And since Vayidaberi told Tovot, he spoke to him kindly. And he put his, his chair, his throne, above the others, the Al, above the other kings who were with him in Babel. So there are many kings in Babel, including Yehoiachin. And suddenly he's elevated above the others. His chair is placed above the others. <coughs> he took off his prison garb. And he was given an allotment of food every day of his life from that point on. A regular allotment of food. He was given an allotment of food for each day. Of the days of his life. And that, my friends, is the end of the book of Yermio and the end of the book of Kings. And now the question is, what do we make of these final verses? It would appear that the book didn't want to end with Babel. 
So we end with being in captivity, but something, suddenly something changes here. King Yehoiachin is let out of prison. He's given different clothing, uh, right? Shinad, he's given different clothing, and uh, he's given food to eat all the days of his life. That's how the book ends. Now the question is, for us, the reader, what do we make of this ending? How do we understand the ending of this? So, it's interesting, by the way, before I get to the small point I want to make, that these, this verse of somebody being taken and his throne is placed above the others, right? And this takes, this is Yechon, this is, uh, this is King Yehoyachim, that some have noticed that this verse, this, this, this phrase, he placed his throne higher than the others, is a phrase that we encounter elsewhere in the Bible. By Yosem et Kiso, right? May al kol hasarim asher hito. He placed his, his chair, perhaps his throne, above the other officers who were with him. Where's that from? Who got that honor? His chair was placed above the other officers who were with him. Who's that? So the answer is, that's actually the description in the book of Esther, Miguel and Esther of, a, of a Haman. Haman. So it's interesting that there's a lot to be said about that. But so this, there, clearly, it's an attack. There, it's for whatever Achashverosh's reason is. It's probably about Achashverosh. But for whatever, he placed his chair above the others. Here, here it's there's the princes. Here it's he placed his chair above the other kings that are with him. So he's getting this big promotion for some reason. Now, it's very different. At the end of the day, he's still in captivity. But there's something about the story over here that suggests, perhaps, I would say, I would call it a, uh, a, a glimmer of hope. A glimmer of hope. Maybe things are changing. Now remember, in the book of Yirmiyahu, he prophesied explicitly that the captivity will be for 70 years. This is right, the 37th year of exile of Yochim. Now, Yochim is exiled before the destruction of the temple, obviously. But we're moving at least, there's some glimmer of hope. It, the book is not going to end on a, on a very positive note. But there is a glimmer of hope over here. And actually, it's interesting that being taken out of jail and given a different set of clothing that we encounter in the Chumash already. It was that? Joseph. That's Joseph. Joseph. Of course. We already see the Joseph stories being employed by Book of Yermia, the story of Gedalia, this is also something which is, I would say, a positive in the certain sense. A positive, the Joseph story is a positive and a negative. He's taken out of jail to suit Pharaoh's needs. He empowers Pharaoh. We end up being enslaved in the land of Egypt. But from Joseph's perspective, he's, he's, in, he's in jail, might be in jail for his whole life. He doesn't expect to get out. And suddenly, things happen not because of Joseph per se, because of the situation that's changed for whatever reason, that the king decides, Paro, it's in Paro's interest to get this guy out of jail. He shaved and he changed his garments. He came before Pharaoh, and then he gets another set of garments. Joseph's always getting new sets of garments. So over here, you have some kind of veiled reference to the story of Yosef in a more positive sense. He's still in Mitzrayim. Joseph's still in Egypt. Joseph is, can't get out. Joseph, it turns out, was the first slave. He didn't realize it at the time. But at the end of his life, he says, we, I can't get out. Someday God will save us. But the book of Exodus, of Breshit, ends with a positive, no, Joseph is, has a prophetic side to him. Someday God will redeem us. He understands the situation they're in. Not so wonderful. He once thought it was a great thing. I guess good, but I kept you alive is good. But meanwhile, we can't get out. My father, Jacob, was the last Jew to get out. We can't get out. But someday we'll be reunited. So there isn't a Joseph story. It's very 
reminds us very much of this, I think. It's about being in exile, but in exile with a certain hope. And over here, we don't know why, what motivated this king to do this. Probably not his love of Yehoiachim in the 37th year of exile. Things are changing on the ground. We don't know what exactly what it is, but he gives him, he gives him his, his meal. He gives him his daily meal. There's something else I want to mention here, not to end on a negative note, but you have the last verse of the book of, of Yirmiyahu, which is the last verse of Kings, and you have a description of the food that is his, his daily allotment of food. The daily allotment of food is called Aruchoto Aruchat Tamid. The Aruchat Tamid it means, it means it's done on a, on a regular basis, it's, it's, it's steady. But the word Tamid is a word that in the Torah we have many, many times in connection with the sacrificial order. In fact, the, the daily sacrifice is called Olat Tamid. The Tamid is the sacrifice that's brought twice a day, morning and evening. Olat Tamid, Sinai. The word Tamid appears over and over again in terms of the priestly garments. Aaron wears this the clothing Tamid. Tamid is a temple term. As is the expression, Dvayom Biyomo, day by day. You have it in conjunction with the sacrificial service. We have it in conjunction with the man. The man falls every day. Over here, we have the tamid and dvayom biyomo, but it's not the heavenly manna that God gives. It's rather the daily allotment of food that the Babylonians give. So on one hand, there's a real sense over here of exile, and I would say not just exile, but remember that the book of Yermio is focusing largely on the destruction of the temple. By the way, the book of Yechezkel focuses not at all on the destruction of the temple. It's not a focus at all on Yechezkel. It's interesting. For other reasons, i get to that now. But the book of Jeremiah is a focus on the temple. Big focus on the temple. Temple will be destroyed. Don't think it won't be destroyed. Shiloh was destroyed. The temple can be destroyed. So you get a sense here in the last verse of the book how much has been lost. Instead of the tamid in the temple, you have the food which is given by the Babylonian king, Dvayom Biyomo. So the employment of temple terms in the last verse, on one end, says to us, the temple is gone. There is no temple. Maybe someday there's another temple, but now we don't have it. We're in Baba, we're in exile, etc. On the other hand, the book ends with some glimmer of hope, I would say, that for whatever reason, things may be changing. It's different. Suddenly, there's a restoration to some extent of the king of Israel, king of Judah. That's Yehoiachim. And uh, remember that the exile is counted from Yehoiachim you have it in the Megillah also, by the way. Megillah has problems with chronology, but Mordechai, right? Mordechai, we're told in the Megillah, was exiled by, went into exile yeah. together with Yechanyah, Melech Yehuda, Yechanyah, Yehoyachim. Because the exile of Yehoyachim, which is prior to the burning of the temple, that was the exile of the aristocracy. That was the leadership, the real leadership. The craftsmen, Harash Vamasker. So Yehoiachim's exile is a very significant moment. And the sense over here, the verse captures the book of Jeremiah very well, I think. It's about exile. It's about no temple. But the, we always want to end with some glimmer of hope. So we end with things are changing on the ground. Suddenly, he's in a more favored position. Perhaps this augurs well for the future. That's what I want to say about the conclusion of our book or I would say conclusions of the book of Yirmiyahu. Um, so again, thanks, it was given the circumstances, it's good to be able to study together. Thank you. Hopefully this will get better. Maybe we're looking for glimmers of hope here. Yeah. We are, uh, it's where we are, we'll do the best we can do. And thank you for participating. Anybody want to say anything here before we stop? Okay, thank you again. Thank you, thank okay. you, thank you. Bye -bye.